Well, welcome back. I'm Dan Roberts, your host of the Tech Whispers podcast. And today we're going to take you uh, inside the playbook of one of what I believe is one of the most intriguing tech whispers in our industry. He's a passionate video gamer. He's also a DJ. He's all business, but he's also a brilliant technologist. And this guest loves taking on those big gnarly problems. And we're going to talk about some of those today. And he does it with a level of energy that his people around him say is really infectious. So that could only be the one and only Gil House, the CIO for consumer and community banking at JP Morgan Chase. We all know, we all know the organization, 2021, $127 billion, just staggering. Fortune 19, nation's largest bank. I, I would say a technology powerhouse as well. And Gil's day job is pretty daunting, right? He's got 12,000 technologists in his organization annual budget of $4 billion. And I would say, Gil, no one, not even yourself, could have written the script for this career journey that you are writing. Going back to digital native companies, you were at PayPal and AOL back when they were just cool and, and brilliant and doing, doing amazing things, Capital One. So Gil, truly welcome to the show. I am excited to be here, thank you. And that was quite the introduction. Well, you know, I'm, I'm actually understating it, but, uh, We'll, we'll get into some of, the, uh, some of the fun stuff here as we go through. And, you know, I'm generally excited about unpacking your playbook. Uh, but first, I've got to share something. I got to get off my chest, Gil, in the full, full disclosure, okay? So, you know, I had a number of what I consider industry influencers coming to me and saying, you got to get Gil on the show. He's just dynamite. And my response to them, and here's my confession, I said, come on, it's banking. How interesting can this be, really? And then you and I had a call, if you, I don't know if you remember it, and I think my opening question was kind of snarky. It was like, Gil, so what's interesting about banking technology right now? So let's start, start from there. You pick it up from there. Tell us a little about yourself and why this is really an exciting place to be right now. Absolutely, and I have a confession to make as well. When I was first approached to enter the banking industry, I had a similar reaction. <clears throat> I said, I'm a technologist. Why would I go and, and join a bank? But that's what's so incredible about what we actually are doing. So at the core of what Chase does is technology. So we spend $12 billion of, uh, on technology every single year so that we are able to deliver incredible experiences for our customers. And we have 60 million active digital customers, the 44 million of them being on, on mobile. And so in order to make that experience work, you have to have technology. Now, it's not just technology that you have to have. You have to have incredible technologists that are part of that experience too. And the tooling, the way that you're solving the problems needs to be exciting. Otherwise, why would great engineers want to be part of it? And that is what we are doing. Because in order for us to not only compete today, but to compete in the future, we need to rethink everything from how we build our software to how we manage that software when it's in production. We have to think differently about how we're organized. and the technologies that we need are all the ones that you would imagine, the cutting edge technologies that are out there. And it's not that we use them because they're flashy words, things like the public cloud, et cetera. It's because we are using data in mass. There's a ton of processing we need to do. And the experience for our customers is, has to be second to none. And what's even more exciting, I think, about banking too is what I didn't realize, and I think I did realize, but didn't realize until really being inside of the industry. Everything in the world revolves around money. I know it's kind of like an obvious thing to say, but it does. And we're at the center of that. And so when we do things well in technology or even outside of it, in technology, we make people's lives better every single day. And so that's really cool. And there's a lot of other cool companies out there doing great things in technology, but you can't go anywhere in the world and not see something that involves money or involves something that we're doing here with technology at Chase. Mm. That's powerful. I mean, I mean, just the story, the mission, you know, how you tie to that, Gil. And, you know, one of your recent writings, I've been reading a lot of your stuff lately, uh, which you, you're a great writer, by the way. I appreciate it. I, I, I suggest people follow your stuff. But you talked about the bespoke customer experience. Now, it's funny to me because bespoke is a word that we didn't really hear about until recently. And now it's, it's become a thing. So tell me what that means in your world. Yeah, well, <clears throat> bespoke, so the, the definition of it, I'll probably get it a little bit inaccurate so we can validate that with an actual dictionary, but it's something that's built for a particular purpose or customer. And um, you hear that a lot because 
when you're solving problems in technology, you can solve problems for a particular use case, or you can solve problems for a broader set of use cases that we are trying to solve for our customers. Now, I'll bring that a little bit to like how we think about that here at Chase. So personalization is a great example of this. I want to create an incredible personalized experience for you or for any of our other customers. If I use data in one experience and I have some smarts there and I don't make it available to somewhere, someone else in the experience. So an example would be you go onto our mobile app and I give you an, an offer or I create some tailored experience, but I do it differently when you go into a branch feels disjointed, it doesn't feel like it's one company. And it can be confusing and frustrating for a customer. And so wow. while you hear us saying that a lot, right, is don't build bespoke solutions. Instead, build solutions that will work for an omni-channel for the entire firm um, as a platform. Um, and we see that. We have things like our My Chase Home um, offers. We have snapshot features. A snapshot, if you go into our application, it will tell you people like you spend this way or you know you could be saving more if you do X et cetera, lots of little insights that we get. But we get that because we didn't build a one use case solution. We built a solution that works for everyone as um, they're coming into the, the experiences that we have. And that's a, a big driver for us. Um, and we're gonna continue to find ways that we are able to use data, um, to use uh, machine learning so we can create those non-bespoke, I don't know if we're coining something here, but the non-bespoke, but the more <laughs> generalized um, solution. And it's, even more important when you think about it, because you said this, the size of our, of our team. We have 12,000 people that are on my team. Every time I say that, it's both um, humbling, scary, but also just really empowering because the work that we do every single day is incredible. But why it's so important that we build these more um, broader general solutions for our teams is because we need our engineers to be able to build quickly, deliver solutions quickly. We need our product, our tech, our design um, teams to be able to do this. If we have data sitting everywhere, individual solutions that have been built differently by teams, it's not only gonna make it harder for teams to get things done, I already talked about the experience, but it's gonna be frustrating for teams to get things done. And we want people to come in here and every single day deliver ship code. And that's the reason why we're so passionate about don't do things bespoke. Yeah, got it, got it. That's very helpful. and. We're gonna double click on some of this stuff as we go through our time together here. But you talked about personalization with customers. On the show, we do personalization by inviting somebody from your circle, some from your, your network who knows you well. And we call it the audience question. And it's just a way for us to, uh, you know, probably ask a question that I wouldn't know to ask. And so uh, be patient with me. I wanna play this for you so you can hear for the first time and uh, tell us who this is and, and then also answer the question. So let's listen in. Hey Gil, it's Rohan, your partner in crime. I have a question for you. What exactly are you doing on Saturday nights at two in the morning? All right, in all seriousness, Gil, you have an incredible passion and knowledge around modern engineering. Where did that come from and how did you get started? Yeah, uh, that's awesome question. I'm smiling because I love Rohan. I, I, I had a suspicion maybe it was going to be somebody like a Rohan that would ask the question. Um, he's been incredible to, to work with. And I, I know you know this, Dan. Um, he was my boss before. Um, he brought me here and I'm uh, forever, forever grateful for that. But he's now our chief product officer and doing some incredible work um, in that space. Um, first, I'll answer his question about two o'clock in the morning. I know why he asked this. <laughs> Making sure that our products work for our customers 24-7 is the, is the number one job that we have. Um, and I might have been out at a club, it was a little later than two o'clock in the morning and my car did not work and we did have an issue. And so I discovered that we worked um, that evening to actually like fix it. But it's that attention to um, the detail and to the experiences that we have that just, I think separates us um, from uh, other companies. Um, but the, the passion around modern engineering, et cetera, um, when I was a kid, I was always interested in technology. I, I've known since day one I wanted to be in computers because I'm just really excited about the tech itself. But also what is really incredible about um, the technology is I like to understand how things work. I've always been curious, like how, how are we able to make somebody log in and make it secure? Like how am I able to browse a website? And how do you do X or do Y? And that curiosity has really led me to 
um, be deeply passionate about technology in general. Now, modern engineering is, I got into this, again, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a kid, but got into this in the workforce to solve problems for customers. And I realized really early on that I liked shipping code. And I think all engineers do, all product design, you know, love shipping code. That's what we want to do. I want to go home. I want to go out with friends. I want to talk about the things that we deliver. And the world has evolved. The industry has evolved over the, not even the past decade, the past two decades, where the limitations that we had because of process or technology, et cetera, have changed. We can now actually build in a different way, faster. We can make it easier for our teams. And that's the modern engineering practice. You'll hear people talk about continuous integration, continuous delivery, et cetera. These things make it easier for our teams to deliver code, so shipping code to customers. And so that's why it's been a passion for me. And the more that I get into the, the field and I, I dig up and I learn, I realize how much I don't know. And that ends up being a bit of an energy thing for me too, is like, how do I learn more and, and help solve this? And the last piece too is in working, with people, particularly like at, from uh, all walks of life and engineers, I see it when they are in the office or even on Zoom and are getting things done. And I see it when they're frustrated. And you can see it in the body language. When they're, when they're getting things done, people are sitting forward, they're in there, they're looking, moving back and forth on screens. When they're not, you see a little bit of this, and they're moving. And I want them to have that first, like be excited, like get this work done. Like people that are excited, that are energized, do better. They are more creative, et cetera. And so pushing to improve our experiences or our modern engineering practice, I should say, that leads to that outcome, which is why I'm so passionate about it. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And you know, kind of kind of taking a look at that, you know, one of my things I like to do is study the isms of great leaders like you, the expressions, the gillisms that you use. And you've got one, and I'll, I'll let you say it, but it's around the shininess in the front, too much focus on the shininess in the front. So what, what does that mean to you, Gil? Yeah, and this, this is a little bit like the last question too. The shy, when you have a mobile app, there are some incredibly gorgeous mobile apps or websites, et cetera, that we, we use. And, and that's wonderful, and they should be. The technology to make it so that I can see all of my balances on the page in real time, that I can make a recommendation to you, like, would you be interested in this particular product or this service because I know information about you, making sure I can do that in a secure way while you're driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour. You're the passenger, right? While you're a passenger driving on the highway, checking the, the, the technology to make that happen is where in my mind, all of the create, not all, a ton of the creativity, some of the energy, the real engineering prowess comes in. Now making a great design is incredibly hard, incredibly important. It takes a ton of work too. But often our designers will say, we need you to make changes on the back end to create this incredibly shiny, elegant experience. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be incredibly proud or invest heavily in our shiny experiences, but sometimes it's a little bit like the, um, 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 in the like I'm thinking like more of the, the Titanic iceberg, right? You have kind of an iceberg where you see the very top, but you don't see the bottom of it, which is, all this other stuff that has to be there to make sure that little piece can float on the top. And that's how I think about the back end systems that we have. And that's why we have the 12,000 engineers that we do because we're so focused on building all of the plumbing that allows us to run at the scale we need to so that we can provide that shiny experience. So really, I do think the shiny experiences matter, but it just doesn't stop there. There's so much else that's behind it. You know, so many people in our audience will never have the opportunity nor the desire to work in kind of a tech startup uh, type, type environment, but how have those early experiences helped you in terms of how you lead, how you think, how you show up, maybe even how you ask a different question today? Yeah, um, it's a wonderful question. When So I've been in some startups and I've also been in big companies, and I think being in those different environments has really tailored a bit of what is in, important to me. When you're in a larger company, you tend to have bigger budgets um, and that gives you the freedom to do things a bit differently. It, however, because you're a bigger company, you don't always see the competitive landscape or you don't realize it's taking you longer than it should because you're in a bigger company. So you ask certain questions in, in a larger company about, great, we have the funding for it. What's the opportune way to build this? You can be thinking more broadly about building a bigger solution. 
But then the contrast of that is being in a startup where you have very little funding. Even if you're a big startup, you will have less funding than a company like we are in here today. And that forces you to think about things a little differently because in a startup, you do care about the competition because typically you're disrupting something. So it matters every single day. And you don't have all of the, the luxury of resourcing. So you have to be crafty and creative. And then of course, time isn't on your side every single day. So it forces you to think about things differently. So having both of those different experiences has really helped me when I'm asking the questions within an organization. Because in a big company here, there'll be times when we are acting like a startup, where we are going after something two week sprints, knocking it out and more and more, by the way, Dan, we are operating that way. But that requires us to ask questions such as, do we really need all the money that we're spending on this? Or could we do it differently? Could we be using something like open source? Or like, do we need in the MVP to have all of these bells and whistles, et cetera? But it also allows me to ask questions, having been in larger organizations such as, yes, we're gonna be launching this and we're doing it in two weeks, but we have 60 million digitally active customers. There's a little bit more thought we have to give into these sorts of, of deliveries. So that's the way that I've been kind of like, framing my questions and what has really led to how I think about it on a daily basis, but it's really those experiences. And frankly, not all of like the startups or other companies have been as successful. And I think there's a little bit of that too, where having, I've done that, that didn't really work out the way that I thought it was gonna work out. And so now if I see something like that, I kind of ask a question like, wait a second, have you thought about it a little differently because it might not go exactly the way that you thought it would go. Yeah. Gil, there's been obviously great decisions made prior to today that have set you up and your organization up to be so successful, right? In terms of some of the things, this bespoke uh, experience you deliver, the idea of having an omni-channel. Um, as you think about the future, setting the bank up for the future, what does a modern software strategy need to do and look like today to set you up for success later? Yeah, um, it is how we, there's a, there's a few items to this. So I'll start with more the, the technical side and it's how we build software. And I mentioned this before, but it's the software delivery life cycle. And the reason why I push on the software delivery life cycle and talk about how we build, how we deploy our code, how we support it is in order to be able to do that quickly. So for I, me to have an engineer and our vision is I can write code, I can test it, I can release it with confidence in the production in under an hour. To be able to do that, the technical challenges, the process challenges, the compliance challenges that you have to work through to get there, fix so many other issues in the organization. And when you do that work, you may not have to release software every single hour. Like you, you, not everything needs that. But if you can, that means that you have streamlined the engine to be able to deliver in ways that you haven't imagined. So you can pivot, et cetera. And that sets us up for where we want to be in the future. And so the first thing about just setting up the organization for success going forward is making it so that our engineers, our product, our design, our data can deliver quickly, predictably, and with quality. And that's part one. The second part of that setup is also making sure we have the right talent. And the right talent is interesting. When I say it, sometimes it can come off a little, the right talent, do not have it. We have the right talent. We have thousands of the right talent, but we want them to stay here. So the 12,000 people we have, they need to know they have a, a great career. They need to have opportunity to have mobility in the organization. They want to work on new cool things or different things like I just described. And so it's incredibly important that we provide that opportunity for the people that are here. Because if we're going to be this going concern going forward, we want the people that are here that are being trained, that are wonderful to be here in five years, in 10 years, et cetera. And we provide a lot of that um, opportunity for our leaders so that they can grow. And the same thing is on those that we want to attract to join the company. And a lot of the reason why I push on the software practices is that's the kind of company that people want to join today. Again, they want to ship code, no matter what role you're in. And if you make it easy to do that, then it becomes, how are we going to use modern technology in a quick way to solve real customer problems at scale and that's incredibly exciting. And that sets the organization up for success. You're making me think of uh, John Rossman, a former Amazon executive. He's got a great book, uh, The Amazon Way. I, I recommend people reading it. He also publishes a, a newsletter called The Digital Leader Newsletter. And he actually wrote about one of your former companies recently, he talked about PayPal. 
uh, Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and all the brilliant people uh, that made that company. Uh, and, you know, he talked about friction, Gil. And, you know, he talked about friction in terms of, I really liked it. He said, it's pretty much the work that we put on our customer and our people that we should be doing ourselves, right? So just kind of park that for a second. Uh, but he highlighted in this, his newsletter that it was an employee who was focused on reducing friction, who actually unlocked what became the premium PayPal service. So I've got two questions for you. First one, were you that employee? And number two, <laughs> you know, how do you think about reducing this friction so you're not putting that extra work on your customer and your employee? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Great two questions. I, I don't think I am that person. I, I hope that I was obsessed about removing the friction, but I don't think I'm the one there. But if you find out that I was, you should let me know on the person they were talking about. Um, but how, how do I think about it? How do we think about it here to remove the friction? I think it's an incredibly important um, uh, point because particularly due to uh, mobile phones, the experiences that we as customers demand are faster, are intuitive, we don't want to do things in a very slow or manual process. If I have to do many steps, we've all been there where you've got to click multiple times, like why, I don't want to do this, I don't have time for it. So I think there's actually something, if I take a step back about how we actually organize, that leads to us being able to first be able to focus on removing friction. So if you think about most organizations, and we were an organization like that, we have many different lines of business, and each line of business has functions they want to perform, such as opening an account, et cetera. And each of those functions has tech teams and product leaders and designers, et cetera. And typically they're aligned again as the, the, the LLBs are aligned. And there's a doctor, Dr. Conway, 1967, wrote um, a, a paper that said, your software will reflect your organizational structure. Why I say this is important is because you see that in a lot of companies, you see it in their, their applications, in their software, you can tell there are multiple divisions, each one's doing something slightly different. When you are structured that way, your software reflects that. By default, if you have to interact between the different divisions inside an application, it adds that friction. Mm. Secondly, if you see it, even inside of, the, of a company and you want to make a change to how it works, you have to talk to 10, 12, 14 people. And by the way, who's the actual decision maker that can help you say, no, we're gonna change this experience. And so what we did, we did this about 18 months ago or so and are continuing to evolve is we organized ourselves in an agile fashion. And we said, we're not going to fight Conway's law anymore. Instead, we're going to organize around product back. So customer back. Now, of course, our CEOs are incredibly important. They have OKRs, et cetera, that help us drive what each product does. But each product, and I'll pick on account opening here, has a product leader. It has a data leader. It has a design leader. And it has a tech leader. They're responsible for account opening, period. That wow. means their experience isn't good. They have the autonomy and the wherewithal to go make that change. We also have been focused heavily on design so that we brought in many more designers. So we're thinking through not just how the pages look or how an app looks, but how it feels, the full experience, design thinking, start to finish for a, a customer. And then we work with our, the, the data leader and the tech leader to make sure we're building it that way. So we obsess over that customer experience to make sure that it's equal or better to anything that is in the market. And that often means removing the friction. And the question that you'll hear is ask a lot is, yes, you can make a button that somebody can click to do something. Do they need to click? Like, could I do that without them even clicking? Or could I do something even outside of this product or further upstream that removes a need for someone to even have to do this at all? And this is where the design thinking deeply comes in but it's also where our data and analytics, and why I mentioned not having bespoke earlier, but having our data being centrally available in real time, because that helps us understand what customers are actually really doing. Mm -hmm. And if a customer really is trying to do something else based on that data, what better way than for us to offer some other solution to them as we're building it? And then if you think about this from, we have 60 million digitally active customers. If I remove one step, for those 60 million active, like that's 60 million clicks that we've reduced. Wow. And that burden is, is huge. Um, and so that's the way that we think about like really removing friction and how we approach it in the organization. Gil, I wish you had more energy and passion. I mean, uh, our, our audience is starting to get to know you a little bit here. And one of the things I find as I study the best leaders like you is that ability to bring 
energy and that positive uh, environment and the ability to energize people. And so I want you to kind of do an out of body experience. Okay. I want you to look down third person, uh, looking down this, this guy named Gil House and it just kind of unpack how has he built this reputation for this contagious energy? How they built this? Um, well, I'll tell you, I am one, I have, as I mentioned, I've been into technology, so I love technology. But the thing that I think has really given me that energy is understanding our customers, what our customers are trying to do. And I, I see this energy also in others outside. I know that I'm a bit of an extrovert and I have a bit of that jovial personality. But I see it in our people too, when you understand the, the service that we're providing for customers. Because every single day, we are helping people use their finances, use their money, manage their finances, you should say, to live their lives. And so every moment I'm thinking about, if we did this better, there's somebody in there who is now able to buy that car they wanted or knows that they can go on a vacation, or is now gonna be better prepared should something happen to their job, et cetera, and savings, and the list goes on. And that purpose gives real energy. And like, there's real examples of this. When you think about COVID, and we had the Paycheck Protection Program, we had a week to launch something. And doing that in a week can be tiring, and we were working around the clock, as you can imagine. It can be tiring, it can be frustrating, but when you have that purpose, and we know this is what we're doing it for. All of a sudden, even though we were tired, even though we, we people were they weren't shaving or sitting there on Saturdays as well, you could see the energy. And we all had that energy because it was really coming from the customer that we're serving. And I think that's what it comes down to is that we have an incredible set of products and services that we offer. We have an incredible customer base. And because of our size, we make a difference in people's lives. And that's incredibly, like that's just a driving feeling for me. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you tie your people to that mission, which is so powerful. You know, your technologists aren't showing up as the bricklayers today. You know, they're, they're really showing up as, as people who have no, those kind of impacts. And speaking of passions, you and I share a passion for what we call tech for good. And, you know, I'm excited to announce, Gil, our company is underwriting $125,000 in scholarships to the TechLX leadership development program. And the cool thing about that on the show is we give you the opportunity to gift a seat in this program. It's a nine month program, cohort based to one of your nonprofits that you're passionate about, that you're involved in. And so when you think about that gift, anybody come to mind you'd wanna share that with, Gil? Yeah, yes, there is. And what's, what's fascinating is I'm actually in Wilmington today. So what's exciting about that is that the, the company or the nonprofit is a Zip Code Wilmington. Um, and we've been working with Zip Code Wilmington since the organization's inception, which was back in 2015. Um, and we helped set up zip code. We contributed to the development of their software engineer bootcamp curriculum. And through zip code Wilmington, we've been able to uh, bring 200 software engineers into uh, the firm since 2015. Um, they continue, uh, the people that graduate from this program as well, continue to be a great source of talent for the firm. They're also a great source of talent outside the firm because zip code Wilmington does work well beyond just uh, JP Morgan Chase. Um, and what is really great about this too, is we see the success of this program, not just that we've hired some individuals from there, but the and zip code Wilmington goes and trains people in programming, et cetera. But we have what we call the software engineering program. You'll hear us say SEPs, and this is an entry level program that traditionally goes through um, universities, so university graduates. But we also have other ways that people can come through. We have an emerging talent program where we go very much like Zip Code Wilmington and we do work to train individuals. But Zip Code Wilmington, we also have their graduates going through our SCP program, which means they are getting the skills they need to be top engineers in our field and in this company. So they're successful, it's a great cause and it's changing people's lives because we're giving careers an incredibly, sought after profession it's i think it's just a wonderful program that's amazing 200 you said 200 people you've brought in from that program jp morgan so, yes wow so zip code wilmington it's wilmington delaware so make sure everyone goes and takes a look at that study it learn from it support it and will i mean what, a, what an amazing thing and we're, we're now going to have someone from that organization who's going to go through this program who they're going to they're going to take their their career to another level so Thanks for being part of this. And you and I both love 
building future ready leaders. I know there's a lot of focus on the company there and, and when we are too. So love to talk to people about that Tech LX program because it's, it's important. We've got a big job to do to prepare our people for, for this field and it's such a great field. Well, wow, Gil, this was been, has been amazing. I mean, the time has flown by. Um, some good news for the audience. We have uh, more uh, with Gil. Uh, in the CI Whisperers blog post. So one week from now on CI.com, Gil and I are going to spend some more time talking about his passion around building a world-class culture, world-class people, workforce, and really dig deeper on the things we started talking about here today, Gil. So on behalf of everybody, the whole team here, our audience, Gil, thanks so much for your time, your energy, being so transparent, letting me badger you. And uh, we will definitely uh, stay tuned and follow your progress. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Um, and I'm now even more energized. I <laughs> love it. I love it. All right. Good luck in Wilmington. We'll talk to you soon.